Good evening. Uh, I'm Len Downey. I'm a professor here at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism. Uh, so I think this is my ninth year. Uh, before that, I worked at the Washington Post for 44 years. Uh, and uh, with the last 17 of those years, I was the executive editor of the paper. For the seven years before that, I was managing editor under Ben Bradley uh, before I succeeded him as executive editor. Uh, and, I, and early on in the 1960s, I was a young investigative reporter in Washington and retained my interest, to say the least, in investigative reporting throughout my career. Uh, whatever job I held at the Post, uh, making sure that we did as much investigative reporting as possible was one of my interests. So it is really a great pleasure for me tonight to introduce you to Carol Lennig, who now is a three-time Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter for the Washington Post. Uh, she joined the staff of the Post in 2000 uh, and uh, started out investigating city government corruption and covering the federal courts uh, and is now an investigative reporter on the Post national staff. Uh, she won the Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting all by herself in 20, I'm sorry, she won a Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting with a team of reporters in 2015. No, I'm sorry, I gotta I got go back again. She won the Pulitzer Prize all by herself in 2015 for her investigation of security problems in the US Secret Service and its presidential detail, which we'll talk more about later. She shared the 20, 2014 Pulitzer Prize for public service for the Washington Post rev revelations of the National Security Agency's surveillance of American citizens, uh, the, the so-called Snowden uh, information. And she shared this year's Pulitzer Prize for national reporting for the Washington Post investigation of contacts between Russia and associates and advisors of Donald Trump. Currently, Carol is, is, is continuing to investigate the Trump White House and the special counsel's investigation of the president. I guess a good place to begin, Carol, would be for you to tell us what you were doing on that team that just won the Pulitzer Prize. So, um, ooh, that is so loud. Um, what I was doing was essentially working with a team of reporters who were already uh, thigh deep in a campaign and a new administration, trying to understand why um, it appeared that the Russian meddling in the election was such a toxic topic to the president. Um, Russians, as you know, the state had ordered sort of a hack of a series of embarrassing emails about Hillary Clinton and then using WikiLeaks, um, dispense them at key moments during the campaign. More details about that are still to be learned, but when I joined the team, they'd already broken open some amazing stories, including the firing of Michael Flynn, who had lied about his contacts with the Russian ambassador. Um, they'd co covered the firing of Jim Comey, who was the FBI director and uh, refused sort of a loyalty pledge when the president sought it and refused to say in congressional testimony that he um, could not uh, verify that there was no collusion by the Russians in the election and in the campaign. So I joined them when they were already off to the races on this topic, but my assignment was essentially understanding what was the legal vulnerability of the um, president's campaign, his political campaign, and ultimately many of the advisors who joined him in the White House. There's a misunderstanding, I think, in the general uh, public about how investigative reporting works, which is encouraged by some of the targets of investigative reporting, and that somehow you are simply the recipient of uh, some dark stranger who shows up on your doorstep with uh, a suitcase full of documents and tells you everything you wanted to know about X. Or it's, uh, it's, you know, it's various people who will call you up and want to leak information about the administration. But you are one of the great source makers that I know. Can you describe how it really works and how you, how you develop, how you find, develop, and manage sources? Um, I have this uh, both a, a blessing and a curse of the low register voice that makes people believe that um, I'm somebody to be trusted. Um, and I take, I, I'm joking a little bit about that but because I do take it seriously when a source trusts me with sensitive information and I make clear to them what I think are the risks of them providing me that information and also the 
the incredible incentives to help the public and the democracy um, by sharing this information with me and ultimately with the Washington Post and the public. Um, to answer your question, um, it is true, no dark, uh, tall st stranger has showed up and handed me a story. It never happens like that. You will get in my business a tip or two. Often they are vague, they are unspecific, and sometimes they are rumors that are half true and half very, very true. Uh, I'm sorry, half false and half very true, and you have to ferret out which part is which. Sometimes, and this has happened a lot in this past year, we uh, and my colleagues will get a tip and we have to beat every bush you can imagine trying to figure out who else might have this information, who might be approachable, and, and who might have an incentive to share it with us. It's a lot of work and it's always fun when you finally land it and you get it and you meet the standard, the very high standard at the Washington Post to publish information which is that if you have anonymous sources, they must be people with a reason to know, some first-hand knowledge, some front row, row seat to this information. It's always a riot when you finally meet that incredibly high standard, and then it is called fake news when you publish it. Um, we, we break our backs to get it, and it, it, it rests upon, ultimately, it, in, I, I think increasingly now, very well motivated and frightened people. I like to use the term confidential sources rather than anonymous sources because anonymous makes it sound like you don't know who they are either, but you're, you're, you have a confidentiality agreement with them. How, how do you first approach a news source like this as somebody who's new uh, and, and uh, help them understand, help to convince them uh, that they should uh, answer your inquiries, help you with the story, even if it goes against, uh, even if it could cause them problems with their job or, or have some other reason why they'd be frightened to talk to you. Uh, and then what kind of agreements do you reach with them? So um, this will bore some of you who I'm, I was in sessions with earlier today, but Len's question is such a smart one. And when I approach a source, and when I realize that they might have some information that might be useful to, for the public to understand a subject better, I think of, of two things. What is the number one fear that they have about what risks they take speaking to me? And what is, what is tops in their list in terms of incentives and motivations to share this information to, with me? And, People accuse reporters of being con men, and I guess in a way we are, because we really certainly emphasize the, um, the good purpose of sharing information with us. But I really try to bend over backwards, now having had sources pay a pretty dramatic price for sharing information with me, the loss of their jobs, for example. After these experiences, which are heartbreaking, I really try my hardest to bend over backwards to explain to sources that, um, and address straight up front what I think are the risks for them sharing information with me. And, and we talk through, I think, in a very genuine way, um, who are, how large a group of people know this. Are you the only other person? Are you one of only three that knows this piece of information? If that's the case, this might be too risky for you to share with me now. Or we may have to find a document or an email or a journal that helps concretize this if you are really one of a very, very small handful of people that know this. I think, you know, I might have frightened away a few sources in this way, frightened in the sense of they weren't able to provide the information that would have been valuable. But I like to think that it's better in the long term and that it is not just a transactional, give me what I need so I can get out of here and nail a scoop. I, um, I try to do what an editor uh, at the Philadelphia Inquirer said to me when I was in my 20s, treat all these people like you're going to be needing them for 20 years. And I do it better now than I used to. Speaking of 20 years, are there sources that you've developed over the years as a reporter that uh, you can go back to again and again because they may rise up the chain of command in, in something, whatever it is that they're doing? And so by taking the trouble to treat them well, to treat them well as sources and to take them seriously and show an interest in what they're doing, when you first meet them, that's valuable later on. I try to talk to students about that idea that anybody that you're interviewing at any time is a potential future source. 
Absolutely. And you know, it's funny, um, this is true for sources and it's also true for newspaper critics, like the most hardened, um, the most hardened readers who think that the newspaper is, is in the tank for one side or the other. Um, when you take the time to understand a subject well and invest with that source a lot of energy to get each little fact right, including the spelling of their name, if you are using their name, including the number of people that were in the room, including the nuance of um, a piece of law that they are the expert in. When you invest that energy, they, they think to themselves, wow, I, I can trust this person with something maybe a little more sensitive, and then maybe something even more sensitive. And um, I think Len, uh, Len knows this because he, uh, while he was quite frightening to me then because I was a junior nobody, he was the editor at the paper that ultimately hired me. Now I'm not, not as scared of him, but he, he does know this. When I took a job covering federal courts, it was a bit of a backwater beat at the time. It was managed by the metro section and I landed in it as I returned from a maternity leave. It was the one job that was open. But the sources I met there um, have been with me ever since. And it's funny, I didn't know this at the time, but Len had been the federal courts reporter years earlier, uh, I don't know how many years earlier. And um, mid 60s. And those assistant U.S. attorneys who were in their 20s when I was in my 20s, those um, judges who treated me as the um, daughter that didn't go to law school and tried to help me understand things, the defense bar that was there, all of those people have um, risen quite dramatically and, and have been in very important positions. I couldn't have known that then, but it um, has been valuable to me many times over to have spent the time making sure that I got the stories about their little nothing cases right way back then. And uh, Bob Woodward always talks about uh, trying to uh, find, find documents to back up what the sources are telling you. Uh, a lot of the reporting you're doing now, there's not much documentation, but to what extent have you been able to seek out and, and, uh, and use documents, and how do you go about doing that? It has been really, um, a, a, unfortunately, a very low document season covering this um, case. I try my darndest to find ways that we can um, have contemporaneous records that buttress what we're reporting. So for example, recently a source came to me and said, um, I won't go into all the details, it would be too revelatory, I suppose, uh, but the source alleged a particular set of facts that would have were very controversial and interesting, and there was no trail of documents to back this up, but the person did keep a contemporaneous um, kind of a diary, a schedule, if you will, of their daily events. And it was a, detailed enough that it corroborated their um, version of events and was important uh, in supporting their work. I, I would say that one of the most disappointing parts of this season is that there are not enough documents. And I've done some really fun investigations with Sarah Cohen, if you all know that professor here and have had some interactions with her. Um, and those stories are kind of bulletproof because nobody can come at you when all the documents show that these are the results. Um, people can fight over the interpretations, but documents are a wonderful tool. You mentioned fake news earlier and just alluded again to the criticisms that this administration levels against the press when it sees stories it doesn't like. Um, how much of that have you felt? Uh, have, have you been personally attacked? I've not been attacked by name, but my stories certainly have been. And uh, I think when I came back into the newsroom in July, I had been on leave writing a, a book, taking longer at it than I should have. And I returned in, right in the, the, the muck of things. And 
I was sort of shocked to have our stories assailed. Everyone else around me on the team was like, huh, this is nothing. Um, but I feel that our responsibility is to just make it plain, more and more plain and more and more clear how we do our stories, document in writing, you know, tell people this is how we learned it. These are the people that provided the information. If we can't name them because they're in too much risk of being named, let's describe how they know the information. And um, let's show how painstaking it is to do these kinds of stories. So even though the president or his team may attack the, the pieces as fake news, readers can see what we've done. In fact, I've even seen a number of, of the, uh, the stories you've worked on and others, um, the number of sources that you've contacted for a story, which, I, which is a, it seems like a new development to me. I saw one that said 12, 12 sources of these various different kinds, some in the White House, some the people that the White House talked to, some in Congress. And that number it, it really irritates the, the president um, because he views and has said, I shouldn't say how he views it, but he has said that he views it as um, a, an indictment of all these people that are leaking things about his administration. I don't like the word leak. A leak is when, um, and I think that this administration and a couple before it m overuse and abuse the word. A leak is when someone provides a classified piece of information or a top secret piece of information that they are not supposed to and that must be referred to the U.S. Attorney's Office for a review about the potential danger it poses to the nation's security. Communicating how much television the president watches or describing um, discussions about firing the attorney general, those are not leaks. That is called communication with a reporter and reporting. Um, you mentioned leaks investigations. The attorney general has said the, the Obama administration uh, uh, it conducted an unusual number of leaks investigations and actually prosecuted government sources of information in, I think, eight instances under the Espionage Act. We've already seen two such prosecutions already by this administration, and the Attorney General says, I think he said that he had three times as many investigations going on as during the previous administration. Is that having an impact on your sources? Does that have an impact on how you approach your reporting? Is there some concern that your, that your sources will be, can be subjects of criminal investigations? And do you even think that they may want at some point to make the point by going after reporters? It does scare me that it is inevitable that when we publish some information that is classified, that there will be a hardcore effort to ferret out the sources. Um, I think, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know which way to tilt on this, the president seems more focused on um, that, that former group, information that is not the subject and can never be the subject of a criminal referral. But we take, as I described earlier, we take a lot of time walking through with sources um, the universe of humans that could have this same information. Um, as I said, I mean, my heart really hurt at the, 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 the punishment that sources who came forward with important information bore as a result of sharing information with me and with the readers. Uh, in this case, mostly about the Secret Service's dysfunction and the danger that, and I found it so ironic that the Obama administration, which claimed that it was the most transparent in history, as you documented so well, was um, going the hardest after leakers and punished the people that were trying to illustrate and demonstrate and out how much danger President Obama was in <laughs> because the Secret Service was not performing its job. I want to come back to the Obama administration's uh, 
performance on, on leaks and his relationship with the press, because I think that context is missing at the moment when uh, so much controversy surrounds this current administration's relationship with the press. But for, I'd like to come, I'd like to talk about the Secret Service investigation. Uh, how did that begin? And uh, you, you know, how, how did you first get on that story? How did you go about, what, 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 what triggered in you the idea of an investigation? Investigation reporting comes in two different kinds. Uh, there's there's the uh, there's the project where you decide that uh, that you or your editors decide that there's something you ought to be investigating. It's going to produce a seven-part series or a series on television or something like that. And then there's the kind of investigative reporting that grows out of beat reporting, where a beat reporter who covers some particular uh, subject comes across something that then becomes an investigation, one story at a time, rather than some big planned-out project. And in Secret Service is the latter. Absolutely the latter. Um, so it began with a fairly salacious uh, story that I wasn't intending to cover. But in 2012, a group of Secret Service agents were in Colombia in South America, and they were uh, sent home uh, rather um, unceremoniously on private planes uh, from this presidential trip because prostitutes had been, they had brought prostitutes back to their room in the hours and maybe, maybe 24 hours before the president was slated to arrive. It was a hot, hot, hot story and a colleague of mine at the Washington Post, David Nakamura, broke it and then I was pulled in to help because, you know, I get people on the phone and I try to get them to talk to me. And I was brought into the story to help David sort of suss out what had happened in Colombia. What in the world were these guys thinking and had anything like this ever happened before? So uh, in the course of doing that reporting, um, you know, we took a lot of care to make sure we got it right. We understood actually that things like this had happened before. Things like this had happened before with senior management. We learned from listening to even the agents who were implicated that they were being punished in a very dramatic way just because the event had become public and that things like this had never been punished before and were not de rigueur, but not <laughs> that unusual. Um, you know, it was kind of like this whole wheels up quality. Uh, these were the spoils of having to work this hard and travel all over the country and miss your family. You're supposed to be able to party like rock stars when you left the country with the president. Um, in the course of doing all that reporting, I met a lot of agents, and I met a lot of their friends, and I Can met... Can I stop you for a second? So you, you, didn't, you hadn't covered the Secret Service before, so you didn't know any of these people. So how did you first, how did you decide who, who, what agents to talk to, and then how did you go about first talking to them? I know this sounds funny, but I'd rather not say. Like, I mean, okay. if I told you exactly how it happened, then it would no, be... I don't mean exactly. I just mean in terms of techniques generally. I mean, did you, did you go through a phone book of Secret Service agents, or, well, you, or you contact one person and that leads to another person to another person? So we did do, Len knows these people really well, but you know, the news researchers, Alice Kreitz and Julie Tate, basically make all reporters look brilliant. They hunt for leads and humans and their cell phone numbers and their parents' numbers and their home addresses, and they hand us these stacks of paper, which are essentially like, you know, real estate leads. <laughs> we like immediately start cold calling and visiting, and that's really how that all began. That's, that's the point. Yeah, um, and they make, again, make us look brilliant. Um, but they're really how this began was kind of like a L'Oreal shampoo commercial, because I met a particular person, and once I had convinced that particular person that uh, I was dedicated to getting this story right and not just sexing up the Cartagena story of how all these guys had prostitutes in their room, but I really wanted to understand the deeper story and explain how management was treating it and how management had treated it in the past. Once I convinced that guy, I got his two friends and then his two friends. and. Uh, Again, it was like establishing a kind of trust. You have to be genuine, you have to be real, you have to deliver on your promise as a reporter. And, and I reaped the benefit of, of delivering what I promised I would do. And then uh, crazy things happened. Uh, people jumped the fence. <laughs> One guy got inside the White House. 
and so on. Uh, how, how, well, what happened there? So I apologize. I made that Cartagena story so long, and Len's like, come on, let's get to how you got to the Pulitzer Prize. So um, what happened was, because I met all these people, they flagged to me, there is something much bigger than hookers in Cartagena. There is something much more serious, which is the decay of our agency, the lack of funding, terrible management, leadership that is corrupt, um, and that the president's not safe. And we have a series of incidents we'd like to share with you about the ways in which the president has been made vulnerable. And you know, at first you're like listening to this going, oh yeah, sure, 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 the Cartagena thing doesn't mean anything, you guys have this other story. But they were able to show me that they were, that the examples that were really quite powerful. Think about how crazy this is. An event in April 2012 leads me to a series of stories in 2014. That's how long it took me to sort of pull all this string and gather it up. You know, in the midst of this, we had Ferguson, we had, you know, Bob Menendez indicted. There were all sorts of stories happening the whole time, but I just kind of kept this notebook of what all these guys, mostly guys, were describing and all of their anecdotes and their documents and their materials that supported it. And finally, you know, at the Washington Post, we have this thing called the memo. And the memo is when you're finally ready to lay out a series of stories that you think you can tell that are part of a big project, part of a big theme, and that, you know, if your memo is really good, you can maybe get some time away from the Menendez case and the Ferguson duty, and you, you have a good enough series of stories that we're gonna let you do it. And finally, I got the guts up to show Marty, and he's like, oh yeah, you gotta do that. <laughs> so, um, the first story that was on my list, which Marty Barron, the executive editor, um, really wanted done was the story about a shooting at the White House that had been covered up um, and not really properly reported. And while I was reporting that story and getting happily a ton of documents, uh, including FBI documents that really told the full story of this shooting and how it had been um, bungled by the Secret Service and then covered up. While I was working on that and almost done with the story, a guy jumped the fence at the White House. And sort of like overnight, my memo became like, uh, I'm sorry, my mom would be so mad that I just said like, my, uh, <laughs> my memo became quite urgent and my series of stories um, became instantly far more relevant than even uh, my Washington Post editors had envisioned or that I had envisioned. So we wrote the jumper story. All the, all the sources that I had had, all since 2012, were ringing my phone nonstop that night to tell me what they knew about the jumper, all the ways in which this had been bungled as well, all the ways in which the Secret Service was trying to paper over what had happened and cover it up in real time, and um, wrote three stories all weekend long, ruined my entire anniversary with my husband, um, and then Monday morning, Marty said, okay, so can you finish up that um, story about the shooting? Because now we really need you to finish that story on the shooting. Wrote the story on the shooting and then wrote the next story on my memo and, it, and that's the answer. For the young reporters out here, she said, you know, a recounting of this, two very important things. One was sources leading to other sources. A couple guys, and then they recommend a couple more guys, recommend a couple more guys. You know, developing that kind of, of, uh, of source relationship. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it, you know, it's not, it's not the first person you found in the phone book and you stay with them. You're, you're constantly asking, in fact, they often should be the last question in an interview is, who else knows about this? Who else can I talk to about this? And can I come back and talk to you again? Because Carol repeatedly talks to sources over and over again. I've had the opportunity a couple of times while waiting to talk to her in the newsroom uh, in years past of uh, hearing her on the telephone with a source. And this is a relationship that she's developed, not a relationship in which she's gonna do any favor with them, but a relate for them, they know that. But a relationship in which, why, when she she's made them partners in getting at the truth, uh, and uh, I'm trying to remember the other thing you said, which was important. Um, it'll come back to me. Yeah, Go ahead. you know it's funny. I remember this is just a passing thing, but Len, I remember the day that I wrote the jumper story, and it was before I finished 
Oh, that was what I was just saying. Was, you, go ahead. I just remember the other thing. She has sources calling her. Something has happened, and she doesn't, even, she doesn't even have to call them right away. They're, they're calling her. It's that kind of relationship that she's established with people who really care about the future of their agency. They care about the protection of the President of the United States, and they know this is an important thing for them to do, is to call Carol and give her information. And that's the kind of relationship you eventually want to develop with sources. I remember, um, now that we're talking about it, that for some bizarre reason you were in the newsroom I don't know if you were just visiting or if you had business to attend. I was visiting and, um, after my retirement. And it was um, the day after a long weekend of writing all the jumper stories. And you came over to me and you, got, you crouched down near my desk and you said, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Uh, so how did you get into this in the first place? What, 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 when did you decide you wanted to be a journalist? How did you go about doing that? And how so early in your career did you gravitate towards investigative reporting? So I think a couple lucky breaks um, and a couple just accidents. Um, uh, I went to school outside Philadelphia and an editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer senior year um, I, I worked on the college newspaper. I won't go in and bore everybody with that, but I, I got kind of the bug about reporting in college as a result of a very compelling and controlling editor of the paper who I admired, and she um, sucked me into it, and I kept working there, and it was a lot of fun. And then I eventually became the editor of the, this little college newspaper. Um, a fairly prominent editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer had graduated from another school that was like the brother school to my school, it was Haverford and Bryn Mawr. And he made a tour my senior year um, to look for um, journalists in the offing that he might be able to sucker into working at the Philadelphia Inquirer for $220 a week in a correspondence program. And we came and we're like interns, glorified interns essentially, who came to work at the illustrious Philadelphia Inquirer. And it was a wonderful paper, which was a Pulitzer factory at the time. And I was surrounded by people who um, were some of the best in the business. And it, and you kind of, that was an, um, a contagious kind of feeling. You, I sat next to a guy named George Anastasia. I haven't thought about him in a long time, but he covered the mob. He's the best guy in the world to cover the mob, totally relaxed, goes to their weddings and their funerals and works the phone like a magic master. And I remember thinking, this, this is what I want to do. This is it. Um, Lucked out, went to the Charlotte Observer after that, part of the Knight Ritter chain that also had owned the Philadelphia Inquirer. And then lucked out when Len decided to raid the Knight Ritter chain and hire a bunch of us uh, to work for the Washington Post, which was my, um, you know, the paper that I grew up on uh, living in Maryland. And I think that's it. Well, yeah, and you started by covering a beat at the Post, which is the normal way to get started. And somehow on that beat, you gravitated into investigative stories. How, how did that happen? You could have covered a beat perfectly well without doing that, I assume, but... Um, I, th I do think that I, I, I was excited about the revelatory quality of investigative reporting. It was very professionally satisfying to have a story hit like a thud. And, and I, I mean that the way I'm saying it, I hope it's getting across, but like for a story to have power, for it not just to be fleeting, um, for it to reveal something people didn't want revealed, and for it to have a life after that day's um, fish wrap, um, to have impact. And I think the lead in water series that, that I sort of happened into, again, working with David Nakamura and Joe Becker. Can you explain that a little bit more? Um, so How you happened into it? Uh, I was covering city agencies, and you guys might not know this, but when I arrived in D.C., we had a legacy of, of broken city government, broken in part because of Marianne Barry and, and years and years of, of poor stewardship of the city. And so my job was sort of to like see would the city fix itself, would it resolve all its 
long-standing dysfunction and would it govern properly? Could it fix potholes? Could it, could it educate kids? Could it, could it do the basic things it was supposed to do? And uh, in the course of this, a colleague of mine, again, interestingly, check this out, David Nakamura, before the Secret Service story, he broke this story, which was in the fine print of a little report that um, the city's water had, had elevated levels of lead for more than a year and a half, likely two and a half years. And this tiny fine print, which was the legally required language, was so buried that nobody in the city knew. So he broke this story, and again, city editor, everybody threw all these resources at us figuring out what had gone wrong. How could this have happened? Why didn't the Department of Health know about it? Didn't the city utility, wasn't, weren't they properly regulated? Um, and that story had so much power because we answered uh, some devastating questions with horrible answers. Um, multiple agencies, local and federal, had known about this and had not done anything about it. Um, in fact, some had, had covered it up. Um, it had had significant health impacts, which we didn't know right away, and that had also, um, we'd also been lied to and the public had been lied to about it. It involved a lot of documents, it involved a lot of source development. I've lost track of the question, am I answering it? Yes, you are. <laughs> yes. It was really satisfying work. Some of the best, even just our little scrappy city hall team, um, we were able to basically say that the EPA, the Department of Health, the mayor's office, um, and a very large profitable utility had put pregnant women and children and older people um, in, in real danger. You, you talked about the satisfaction of those kinds of stories having impact. Where's the line for you between impact and a desired outcome, which obviously is definitely facing you now in, these, in the reporting you're doing about the Trump administration, where you, you, want to, you want to reveal things that you believe the public should know on the one hand, and on the other hand, is there a temptation to, to think of some desired outcome? You know, you want, you want to see change occur. I do not have any desired outcome, except that we share the truth with readers. Actually, it's a little bit awkward. I don't know if this is the, what your question is getting at, Len, so forgive me, but one really awkward thing that happens in Washington a lot now is that people will come up to you if you're a reporter at the Washington Post, particularly if they're a liberal Democrat, and they will say, thank you so much for what you're doing. You're gonna bring this president down. And I frown and say thank you, except that's not my goal. Um, my goal is to share this information with you and publish what's true and democracy will decide the rest. You know, our House of Representatives and our Senate may decide, our criminal justice system may decide. Um, please thank me for the amount of time I'm not spending with my children and my husband getting information for you, but I, I really don't have a goal. This is such an important distinction uh, about investigative reporting. Uh, I was one of the editors on the Watergate story many years ago, as Carol knows. And we never were trying to force Richard Nixon to resign or be impeached. I was also the editor of the Washington Post during the investigations of uh, Bill Clinton. And we never were seeking to have him impeached or removed as president. We were seeking to inform the public about what they needed to know and leave it to the public and the various parts of the government to do their, to do their job based on our information. Um, you frequently have worked in teams. It used to be investigative reporters were lone wolves. I remember back in the mid-1960s when I was an investigative reporter for several years, I did all my work myself. I couldn't imagine working with somebody else. It was exciting to be this lone wolf detective out there. Uh, so what's it like to work on these teams, some of which become quite large now? Well, you know, I was talking to my friend Roz Helderman. If you see her name in a byline, definitely read the story. She's like a walking dictionary about Russia and the investigation. Um, but I was talking to her about this very point. You know, what do you think is the reason we now have four bylines on a story? You used to, get, you used to have to get permission to have <laughs> three bylines on a story. Now we have four, and 
seven people on the credit line, which is the tagline at the bottom of the story, showing just how many people have been invested in this. And I said, what do you think is the deal? Do you think we've gotten more collaborative? And she said, no, the stuff is coming at us so fast. <laughs> no one person can do it. And it is, it is breakneck pace. Um, to the point that I actually am a little bit worried. I, I am an investigative rep, um, reporter by, by instinct, by gut, by that's what I really love. And I'm not sure that we're landing with a thud anymore the same way. It's like, that was the morning story. Here's the afternoon story. We got another one for you. Um, I'm a little anxious about it. The teamwork is amazing. Everybody pulls together. There have been a couple, you know, big egos, but overall, um, I'm so proud of how how seamlessly and how hard everyone works for the joint purpose, which is fact. Collaboration is a very, very important aspect of uh, of modern modern journalism. For those of you getting into journalism, uh, being able to sacrifice your ego to be part of a team that's going to do better work than you could possibly do by yourself, uh, obviously with some exceptions. Pretty soon we want to be able to make time for questions from the audience. Let me just ask you about um, the, uh, the N N NSA, Surve National Security Agency surveillance stories based on the, uh, the, 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 the digital documents provided by Edward Snowden. Um, uh, how did that work? That's unusual. That wasn't that. Would, you were handed something in that case. The Washington Post, in, 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 in the person of Bart Gelman, uh, was handed these uh, handed all these uh, this trove of information. And then what? That was a, um, an amazing event because Bart Gelman, who's a you know, uh, had been a role model of mine and a colleague all at the same time, had left the Washington Post and. Um, all of a sudden mysteriously showed up in our pages one morning and <laughs> very few of us knew the story that he had and it was the first crack at revealing some of what Edward Snowden had shared with him about a warrantless um, broad surveillance of Americans who um, for whom there was no probable cause that they'd been involved in anything terrorist or illegal and after that first story, uh, editors decided that there were a couple reporters at the Post who could help Bart get these stories into the paper more quickly and also help because of their expertise in particular areas. My expertise at that time, again, luckily from my boring little sleepy beat at the federal courthouse, was that I knew um, how the FISA court worked, which was the a secret surveillance court, a group of judges that rotate in deciding whether or not to sign off on secret warrants to spy on both foreign and uh, U.S. persons. I knew how that court worked and I knew the chief judge is going back because there had been several of them and I had some sources who had some familiarity with that court and knew how it worked. I won't bore you with it except to say that the president, Obama at the time, insisted that the FISA court had been a great backstop against all of this warrantless surveillance and that they had been properly um, making sure that the warrantless surveillance was done carefully and judiciously. And um, the FISA judge, when I went to talk to him about it, he'd not been interviewed by anyone and never had given an interview before. When I went to talk to him about it and told him what the president had said and what our documents showed from Mr. Snowden and shared that with him, he said, no, we knew nothing about this and we were not a backstop. We couldn't be a backstop for something we didn't know anything about. And that was a, a fairly big deal and put a big hole in the idea that this program was so carefully vetted. So again, again, that's a story that did not come out of the, what was given to the Washington Post. It's something you got. And again, as an example of sources that she developed long ago, once again being useful uh, down the road, uh, which is very, very important about source development. Uh, in a couple minutes, we're going to take your questions, so you may want to start coming up to the microphone here. This is being recorded. It'll, become, it'll be archived by the school. It'll be useful in, in classes. I know I'll be using it in my classes in the future. So if you want to start up, start up to the microphone. Well, I'll ask Carol one last question of my own, which is, um, with all this kind of work that you do that's so sensitive, and I know that Bart Gelman, for instance, is a 
verges on being a nut about security and trying to prevent himself from being hacked and his records being hacked and so on. Uh, what concerns do you have about that, about the, about the confidentiality of your work with sources and, and so on? Do you take precautions with your emails? Do you take precautions with your phone calls? I have been asked this question many times, and even though I like Len most, more than most of the people that have asked me this question, I will give the same answer, which is, yes, I take precautions. <laughs> Fine. That's just what I wanted to know, because that's, again, something I think that a lot of students don't realize is now becoming pretty de rigueur amongst reporters, particularly involved in national security, politics, and, uh, and investigative reporting. Meeting in garages is a good idea. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yes, you have a question. Hi, thank you so much for coming and speaking today. Um, my question is- oh, Please identify yourself each oh, as you ask your question. Sorry, uh, my name's Camden Cook. I'm a freshman here at Cronkite. Um, and my question is, what would be your primary piece of advice for aspiring investigative reporters? Oh, um, throw yourself into every opportunity that's brought to you. Uh, it's easy to work really, 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 really hard at your age. <laughs> so, so offer for offer for weekends. Offer for offer to work on every team that needs an, a helping hand, um, even if the work might seem low uh, pay slash low um, low status. You'll learn a lot from the people that you're around. I feel like I learned so much again from those guys in the. Uh, in the room in the Philadelphia Inquirer, just sitting next to people that were the pros in their work. And um, you'll be amazed what you will gain from it. I always tell uh, uh, students uh, that it really doesn't matter where you work in terms of the reputation of the news organization uh, uh, so much as finding a place where there's at least one editor or one reporter who's really good. Mm -hmm. Probably has been there a long time. Really knows the, really knows that area, and has and, and has a lot of tricks of the trade. And then get yourself mentored by that person and do good stories under that mentorship, uh, because it, it, you learn more from that usually than, well, in addition to journalism school, but more than you would formally learn from relationships with editors. Is that other journalist in that newsroom who's really good, who can really teach you what things you want to know? Uh, you, 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 thank you for that question. Uh, you mentioned something about uh, about home life. I, I meant to ask you that too. Uh, I also warn students. I think I think obviously being a journalist is a great calling, uh, and and, uh, and it's great to aspire to it. But I also warn them: it's it's not good for your social life. You're not gonna you're not gonna be popular. You're not gonna be going out to dancing a lot. And when you get married, you're not gonna be home a lot uh, uh, when you're doing your work. It's just something you have to manage, and you have to be ready for that. How do you manage that? Um, I have a great mom who lives nearby, and I have a, a great husband. I have two pretty responsible daughters. So, and I, for many years, I had this person that lived in our house, an au pair actually, who was just amazing. And again, she saved my bacon a million times. But um, I do find myself um, trying to. Um, carve out special time, like when I can have this time with my family, like throwing my phone over here as much as I can. It's not easy to do, but I think if you're gonna have an hour with them, have it without all of the interruption. And you know, if the president fires sessions in that hour, I guess I'll just have to give that one up. The, the word, the concept of compartmentalization I got a bad uh, got a bad rap, I think, probably during the Clinton administration when he clearly compartmentalized different parts of his life. But that's really helpful to, to journalists is to be able to compartmentalize, uh, to be able to be focused on what you're doing when you're doing it journalistically, and then, as you say, if you've set a time to turn it off, then go into that compartment for a while. You'll come back to the other one later. I mean, it's it's, it's difficult to do. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Raul Bencomo. Uh, thank you for coming and speaking to us. i um, transfer student here at Cronkite. Um, you know, the art investigator reporting, you know, the art of anything usually encompasses a, a type of uniqueness or imagination. So uh, I guess my question is for both, if, if, if willing. Um, do, you, do you believe uh, journalism is a necessity or an asset, journalism school? And um, in particular, if you do think journalism school is, is, is as important, um, what in particular makes a great journalist school? 
Thank you. My answer will be quick. I um, did not go to journalism school. I didn't think it was necessary, but I look at this school and I look at some of the others that I've visited and I can see what an asset it is. Um, it's stunning what, how, what a professional level uh, of, the, of the trade is being practiced here and learned here. So that's my answer. Until my later years at the Post, uh, when, the, when the digital revolution came along, until then, the, the skills of journalists were so, um, so narrow uh, that it didn't matter to me as a hiring person whether you went to journalism school or not, but what you showed me in terms of your clips and other things about what kind of journalist you were. So you could be a good journalist as a biology major at Haverford, uh, and, and because, because you've shown me that in your summer internships and so on, as well as a graduate of the Columbia School of Journalism. But, but that's changed now. And now the, the skill level that's required, so many different skills, all the digital skills that are required, I think makes it all the more important to actually go to journalism school. You should have another major. You should become an expert on China or the law or something else at the same time, because that makes you more saleable and a better journalist at the outset when you first get your first job. But you really need to learn all the skills that you learn here at the Cronkite School, which is why no, there's no longer a broadcast track here or a digital track or a print track or something else. You have to learn all the skills because the people that are being hired now by most news organizations are multi-skilled journalists. And in fact, when you're being hired, you don't know if you're going to be, when you're looking for a job, if you're initially going to be somebody who covers the police department or you're going to be somebody on the night shift of the, uh, of the, of the website, uh, you know, having to, having to put things up on the website, or whether you're going to be primarily a videographer for a while. So I think that, that makes journalism school more important now than it used to be. And I'm a journalism school graduate in the early 60s, so I, that's why I said that. Thank you both. Yeah. Yes. Hi, thank you so much. I'm Stacy Galandi with the Women's Eye podcast, and I was a freshman 30 years ago. So <laughs> um, I wanted to find out, is it unprecedented this administration in terms of the investigative reporting that has come out of it, and do you think that it sort of raised the bar for investigative journalism? Where do you think it's going? <laughs> <laughs> do you have a prediction? And of course, what did you really think of the movie The Post? <laughs> Three questions in one, not bad. I know. <laughs> um, okay, let me see if I can Loaded that. Loaded for questions. Um, I don't, I don't think that the volume of investigative reporting is um, dramatically different now than it was under the last several presidencies. I think the volume of reporting is stunning, which is different. I mean, we're doing a lot of reporting, but I'm, I wouldn't put it all in the investigative basket. Um, How, where do I think this will all end? Um, I would just say what I have reported, if you don't mind, which is um, I don't believe, based on um, what Mueller has indicated to Trump's attorneys, that he is going to charge the president with any crimes if he finds any evidence of them. Again, a big if, if he finds any evidence. I believe he's going to, again, based on what he's said to Trump's attorneys, that he's going to produce a report about uh, acts that the president took that appear to involve efforts to obstruct the probe and that the Congress will have the task of deciding what to do with that information. And The Post was an amazing movie and even though everyone at The Post is steeped in the lore of that moment, uh, I found it suspenseful and, and gripping and, and wonderful. And I have to say as a, as a half century Post person, it's still in my heart, the fact that the New York Times hated that movie was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to play you in the movie? <laughs> so, thank you so much. Hi, uh, my name is Dylan Samard. I'm a sophomore here at the Cronkite School. And my question is that um, in an environment internationally that's increasingly hostile to journalists, how does this upcoming generation of journalists sort of reverse that trend? I'll start this one. I don't, I, 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 just by doing, my successor at the Washington Post, Marty Barron, puts it best, just do your work. And the, the, more, the more good work that's done, at least in this country, uh, the better it will be for the future of journalists and journalism. Uh, around the country, around the world, I think it's going to require uh, more 
activism than there's been so far by journalists in this country and by journalists in other countries where, where uh, they're still free, relatively free to do their work, to uh, be more vocal and find more ways to keep, uh, to, to keep people's attention on the fact that journalists are literally being killed for doing their work in many countries, that even countries in the European Union right now are beginning to limit uh, the freedom of journalists in some of those countries in Eastern Europe. And this should be a scandal. This should be something that journalists in this country uh, and Britain and other countries where journalists are free, like France, uh, should be making a much bigger deal out of. There is something called the Committee to Protect Journalists, which does a really great job of keeping track of all this and, uh, and, and, and being as active as it can be and doing something about it. But I think that more American journalists need to join in this. The fact that so many journalists are being, I refuse to go to Mexico. I won't go there on vacation. I've turned down speaking engagements there, not because I'm afraid for my own life, but because they kill journalists in Mexico. And the government allows it, and the government in some cases is behind it. I will not go to a country like that. And I think American journalists should take those kinds of stands. Thank you so very much. You're welcome. We got time for one last question for Carol, and that is, <laughs> as you become increasingly uh, well known as a journalist and increasingly uh, winning of prizes for your journalism and, and your wisdom is courted by TV, you are on TV. Uh, and so what's it like, how, how, what rules do you have for yourself in becoming somebody who's interviewed on TV, on a panel on TV, as we so often see, especially in uh, cable television? I'm not sure I always do this um, perfectly or as well as, as probably Len would handle himself in these situations, but I try my darndest to um, avoid snark and opinion. I, re I am often lured or, or courted into giving my opinion, and I try to focus on what we've reported in the paper. Um, sometimes some of the the uh, hosts don't give me enough time to say much more than the lead of our story. So, um, but you know, ultimately America is getting increasingly divided, as you all know, into two echo chambers. One, uh, on one side, everybody wants to, in, in both of them, people are being told um, what they want to hear. They seek out that echo chamber. They seek out that news source, whether it's Fox or Rachel Maddow, Sean Hannity, or MSNBC, they seek out this entity that will tell them what they already believe. And I don't want to fall prey to that. I just want to give the facts. It is true that I'm on MSNBC a lot and not on Fox a lot. Um, perhaps that's because the facts that I'm providing are more appealing to one side than the other. But we, I just want to stick with what we've reported. and. Um, it is increasingly, I know by Len's question, what he's saying about when you get more famous, you get to be more of a celebrity and you start to like cultivate this brand. The brand I like, the Washington Post. The brand I like, good old fashioned quality journalism. Uh, if I benefit from that, great, but it, it's, it's all for the purpose of giving people revelatory information they wouldn't have if we weren't um, in the trenches. Great place to stop. Carol's a wonderful role model for the students here. Carol, thank you so much. Thank you. For coming to do this. Thank you.